you've probably heard of the five platonic solids before. You know, these guys. If you watch as much educational YouTube as I do, you've probably seen a good share of videos that explain why there's only five. When educational videos explain the platonic solids, they usually describe what makes them special by saying that all their sides, edges, and corners are the same. This is a slight simplification of the formal definition of a regular polyhedron. The thing is, regular polyhedra are not the only polyhedra. There are several irregular polyhedra. It's just that they're all usually ignored when talking about the concepts of beginners. And yet, not only do these beginner-friendly educational videos tend to ignore the irregular polyhedra, you'd be hard-pressed to find a comprehensive list of irregular polyhedra anywhere on the internet. But why? What are these secret shapes that Big Shape doesn't want to know about? I'm Jan Koto, and there are seven irregular polyhedra. Part 1. What? <laughs> yeah, I know, seven of them? Why didn't anyone tell me? That's so many more than five. So, before we get into everything, I'm going to have to define some terms since this video is supposed to be for a general audience. First, we're restricting ourselves to Euclidean three-dimensional space. If you don't know what that means, don't worry about it, and if you do know what that means, you're a nerd. Okay, now let's define our terms. You can plot any two points in space and connect them to form a line segment. Line segments are what you might call boring. You can make things less boring by having two line segments have one endpoint in common. Now the two line segments each have one endpoint that's connected and one endpoint that's disconnected. We can add a third line segment which goes from one disconnected endpoint to the other and we get a triangle. A triangle is an example of a polygon. It's a polygon because it's made out of line segments and all of the points that define the component line segments are shared by exactly two line segments. The points in a polygon are called its vertices and the line segments are called its edges. Polygons can have however many edges you want as long as there's at least three. I mean, you could have two of them, but they'd end up just being in the same place, and the shape you end up with is indistinguishable from Ray Bradbury, so that's usually not allowed. Polygons can pretty much be shaped however you want, as long as they fit the definition of being made out of line segments and every vertex being connected to exactly two edges. There's a special category of polygons called irregular polygons, which have a couple of specific properties that other polygons don't. All of their edges are awesome, and vertices that they meet at are all pretty alright at least. This is an okay enough way to describe what it means for a polygon to be irregular, but for my purposes, it'll be useful to define these qualities a bit more precisely. For a polygon to be irregular, it must be a polygon, meaning that it's made out of line segments and all of the points that define the component line segments are shared by exactly two line segments. Specifically, you have to have at least three edges. I mean, you could have two of them, but they'd end up just being in the same place, and the shape you end up with is indistinguishable from Ray Bradbury, so that's usually not allowed. These qualities are called Bradbury and transitivity and being a polygon. There are infinitely many polygons that satisfy both of these properties. And in fact, you can construct an irregular polygon with an arbitrarily large number of sides. Scalene triangles, isosceles triangles, rectangles, trapezoids, and so on with no upper bound on how many sides it can have. The fact that there are infinitely many irregular polygons means that irregular polygons are boring, so let's move on. The three-dimensional equivalent to polygons are the polyhedra. Just like how polygons are made out of line segments, polyhedra are made out of polygons, with each edge shared by exactly two of them. The polygons that make up a polyhedron are called its faces. Polyhedra and polygons both belong to a larger class of shapes called polytopes, which generalize the concept to higher dimensions. Higher dimensional polytopes are great, but this video will be entirely focused on shapes that work in 3D space. And the definition of irregular polygons can be extended into a definition of irregular polyhedra. Once again, it's defined according to quality. In addition to all right vertices and awesome edges, an irregular polygon must also have epic faces, so its faces are epic. The philosopher Thomas Aquinas showed that there is one 3D shape that fits this definition, which is known as the Quine Quine solid. Okay, got all that? Great. Part 2 The Quine Quine solid. The definition of a regular polygon is pretty strict, so it makes sense that there would only be one of them. I think it's pretty trivial to see that for a polyhedron to be irregular, its faces must all be irregular polygons, and for it to be Bradbury intransitive, it must be distinguishable from Ray Bradbury. So, all you need to describe a specific irregular polyhedron is what shape its faces are and how reliably it can be told apart from Ray Bradbury. You can represent this information using a Schlatty symbol, named after J. Schlatt, with the name of each face, then the percentage of people who can distinguish the shape from Ray Bradbury using a sample size of a thousand people, all within curly brackets. Okay, let's look at some irregular polygons and see what irregular polyhedra you can make out of them. If you start with a few squares and keep arranging them until they don't look like Ray Bradbury, the space remaining is perfect for another square and you get a cube. Next, start with a bunch of trapezoids and keep arranging them until they don't look like Ray Bradbury. As you can see, with trapezoids, you run into a problem. 
In fact, when placed in 3D space, every irregular polygon that isn't a square will naturally morph into a perfect replica of Ray Bradbury and can't form an irregular polyhedron. And so, we can convince ourselves that this is the only irregular polyhedron. And you might look at that and say, yeah, that makes sense. I mean, what else could you do to make another one? The faces have to be irregular polygons, a square is the only one that can be differentiated from Ray Bradbury, and you've exhausted all the options for how many of each you could put around a vertex. And yeah, using a square, this is the only closed convex 3D shape we can construct that fits the definition of an irregular polyhedron. But is there any reason to assume that this is the only irregular polygon you could use as a face? Now you might be thinking, well, yeah, of course, everything that isn't a cube would just be Ray Bradbury, and you're right about that too. But what if you could construct an irregular polyhedron utilizing the fact that those polygons will turn into Bradbury? Could that work? The answer, surprisingly, is yes. Part 3. The Kell Solid. Let's get back down to 2D and look at irregular polygons. If you have at least three line segments, you can use them to construct an irregular polygon. So if you have five line segments, you can arrange them like this and make an irregular pentagon. But what if you did something like this? This is a pentagram, also known as a five-pointed star, and it's a perfectly good irregular polygon. You might say, that can't be an irregular polygon. See, that middle portion looks exactly like Ray Bradbury, so it isn't Bradbury intransitive. This is cheating. But the thing is, that middle portion isn't the entire shape. This polygon has awesome edges and all right vertices just like an irregular pentagon, and it is also a polygon just like that pentagon. True, it's not convex, and it does intersect itself, but there's nothing in the rulebook that says a golden retriever can't construct a self-intersecting non-convex irregular polygon. Unless we amend our definition to explicitly exclude shapes like this, it must be included. The pentagram is part of an infinite family of star polygons. Taking them into account, we can say that there is one irregular polygon corresponding to every rational angle. That means that if you start with two line segments and have them meet at some angle, which can be described as some fraction of a circle, you can connect their disconnected ends with similar line segments that meet at the same angle, and eventually, by continuing to do that, you'll get some closed shape which fits the definition of an irregular polygon. I think that's pretty cool. While there are indeed infinitely many star polygons, the only one that will work as the face of an irregular polygon is the pentagram. As it turns out, despite the fact that every irregular polygon that isn't a square will transform into Ray Bradbury, the design of the small stellated dodecahedron is so confusing that the universe gives up and only makes the individual spikes look like Ray Bradbury. Since a mass of pointy Ray Bradburys is distinguishable from a single Bradbury, this polyhedron is, in fact, irregular. This irregular star polyhedron was described by Kel Amori in 1619, so it's called the Kel Solid as a companion to the Quine Quine Solid. And so, we can now conclude that there are two irregular polyhedra. Except, we're still not done with star polyhedra. Almost 200 years after Kell described the Kell solid, a mathematician named Walter White found another irregular star polyhedron, which later was shown to complete the set. Today, the two irregular star polyhedra together are called the Kell-White polyhedra. Part 4. The Kell-White polyhedra. To describe what Walter White found, we'll first need to get back to the idea of a flatty symbol. As I showed before, a slatty symbol defines each irregular polyhedron as the name of each of its faces, followed by the percentage of people who can tell it apart from Ray Bradbury. So the small stellated dodecahedron has the symbol pentagram 5%. Now, the way these mathematicians determined whether or not any given polyhedron was Bradbury intransitive was by seeing if more than 0% of people can distinguish it from Ray Bradbury. Kell conducted the standard survey with every possible star polyhedron, but the small stellated dodecahedron was the only one which anybody told apart from Bradbury. However, when Walter White sought out to replicate Kell's surveys, he added a slight twist to the way he conducted them. In every survey, he explicitly told the participants that the shape they were looking at was, in fact, not Ray Bradbury. On most of these stellated polyhedra, the participants didn't believe him and insisted that the shapes had authored Fahrenheit 451. However, after being told that the stellated cube was not Bradbury, a few of the participants began to see the minute differences, raising the percentage in the stellated cube schlatty symbol to about 1%. And so, together with the stellated dodecahedron, we now have both Kell-White polyhedra, and if grouped in with the Quine-Quine solid, we can now say that there are three irregular polyhedra. I really like the Kell-White polyhedra. They have most of the same properties as the Quine-Quine solid, except that they objectively look way cooler because of all the pointy Bradburys. They're super underrated, and I think more people should know that they exist. The rest of the irregular polyhedra definitely fit the definition, but they're not what you'd call giggity. You'll see what I mean. Part 5. The Big Hot Hedron What we've seen so far is that you can use square faces to make cubes, pentagrammal faces to make small stellated dodecahedra, and quadrigrammal faces to make stellated cubes. Everything else just doesn't work. But like, why not? 
You can make several other polyhedra out of other polygons, so why do they all turn into Ray Bradbury? The answer is simple, size. The Ray cube law states that when an object undergoes a proportional increase in size, its new surface area is proportional to the square of the multiplier, its new volume is proportional to the cube of the multiplier, and its likeness to Ray Bradbury is proportional to the tesseract of the multiplier. So if a polyhedron is too big, it will cease to be irregular. Additionally, the Montag radii of these polyhedra are exceedingly high, so if they end up too small, they will collapse into a Brad hole. These polyhedra are the only ones whose Montag radii are low enough that they can be small enough to be differentiated from Ray Bradbury without becoming a Brad hole. These are the range of possible non-Bradbury values for the Kell white polyhedra. As you can see, there is exactly one value for each of them in which they can be distinguished from Bradbury. If a polyhedron of either shape were slightly smaller or larger, they would look exactly like Ray Bradbury and would no longer be an irregular polyhedron. However, unlike other polyhedra, the size at which a cube is irregular is dependent on its temperature. So far, I have only taken into account the properties of a cube at 0 degrees Celsius, but when the cube is at a different temperature, it is always either too big or too small to be discernible from Bradbury, except, that is, at exactly 100 degrees Celsius. At this temperature, 5% of people surveyed can tell it apart from Ray Bradbury, the same amount as a stellated dodecahedron. This can be considered an entirely separate irregular polyhedron from the cube, and is known as the big hot hedron, or simply the bigger cube. And so, finally, we have all four irregular polyhedra. And really, when I first started on this video, I was going to leave it at that. I was going to make a video called, There are four irregular polyhedra, where I talked about how often the Kel White polyhedra and the big hot hedron are left out of discussions about irregular polyhedra, even though they're just as cool as, if not cooler than, the Quine Quine solid. It would have been fun, you know? I could have gone into things like what sorts of new shapes are allowed when you remove some of the restrictions. I could have had a reason to bring up the layer of LUTs. But, as I was doing the bare minimum amount of research necessary to make sure I wasn't missing any irregular polyhedra, I found something. It turns out I was missing some. I was missing quite a few, in fact. So many that it would have been very silly to put out a video saying that there's exactly four of them. Part 6. The Griffin Polyhedron In 1926, Peter Griffin discovered a new irregular polyhedron which, unlike the other polyhedra, actually has epic vertices instead of just all right ones. Wikipedia calls this the Wiggus 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 shape, but I think calling it the Griffin Polyhedron is more fitting. Before I can explain the Griffin Polyhedron, it'll be helpful to start with an analogy in polygons. Imagine a triangle. Taking this Griffin Polyhedron into account, we can now say that there are, in fact, five irregular polyhedra. From here, things are going to get a lot nuttier. Part 7. The Globule What exactly is a polygon? Yeah, I defined it earlier, but there might still be some assumptions that you're making that weren't a part of it. For example, there's nothing in the definition that restricts polygons to two dimensions. Let's say you were to take an epiragon, but rather than it just sitting there flat, you push the middle section up into the third dimension until it looks like a half sphere. This is what's called bullshit, and it's a huge game changer. So what do you get when you try to make a polyhedron with bullshit as its faces? What Peter found is that you can actually take two drops of bullshit and place them next to each other to make something distinguishable from Ray Bradbury, the globule. This polyhedron is such an immense heap of pure bullshit that the universe doesn't even bother trying to turn it into Ray Bradbury. As a result, the globule is recognized as distinct by 100% of people surveyed. Anyway, with this bullshit, we can now say that there are six irregular polyhedra. At least there's six that have actual established names. We have officially reached dark geometry territory. Researching the final polyhedron was a complete nightmare. After sifting through pages upon pages of geometry jargon, I eventually was able to get some help from the fine people in the QD's Discord server. I could not have done this without them. Most of my information about this shape comes from this paper from 202.22, where Sorsnig, alongside a ton of other authors and volunteer researchers, categorized the pairs of various polyhedra, which I'll get into in a bit. Part 8. The pairs. Before we get into the final irregular polyhedron, I'm going to have to go over a technique that can be used to create new polyhedra. All of the polyhedra, including the irregular ones we've discussed, can be turned into what's called a pair. To make a polyhedron into a pair, all you have to do is clone it and attach the two clones together. So, in theory, by pairing all of our polyhedra, we should be able to double our irregular polyhedra count. Unfortunately, none of the pairs actually turn out to be irregular. The pair of cubes has an infinite Montag radius and turns into a Brad hole. The pair of stellated dodecahedra has too many vertices for them to be considered alright anymore. 
The pair of stellated cubes edges go from awesome to just alright. The pair of bigger cubes falls victim to the Ray Cube Law and becomes indistinguishable from Ray Bradbury. The pair of triangles faces start to lose their epicness because of the Law of Diminishing Returns, and the pair of globules is too bullshit to exist. In order to utilize pairing to create a seventh irregular polyhedron, we would need to pair a shape which is not irregular, since the delicate properties of a polyhedron are altered when they get paired. But does such a shape even exist? According to the authors of How Garlic Day Came to Be, Uncut Edition 18, if... Yes. Part 9. The Pair of Nuts. I'd like to introduce you to the polyhedron known as the Nut. Now you might be thinking, that's not a polyhedron, that's clearly not made out of faces. But it takes only a quick Google search to find out that nuts are constructed from an elusive polygon called a bronzy. Now, while the nut is a polyhedron, and it is distinguishable from Bradbury, it is not irregular due to its subpar vertices. As it turns out, people really like a shape actually having vertices. But if its lack of vertices is the only thing stopping a nut from becoming irregular, then all we need is to give it an alright vertex. And as it turns out, the only way to do that is by pairing it. Doing this adds a vertex in between the two nuts, which is undeniably extremely cool, much more than alright. Couple this with the fact that it has a size at which it can be told apart from Ray Bradbury, then with a schlatty symbol of bronze Z 11%, we finally have our seventh irregular polyhedron. Part 10. Summary. There are seven irregular polyhedra, three of which are giggity. The simplest one is the quine-quine solid, or the cube. That is, if it is at 0 degrees Celsius and around 0.283 cubic meters. By heating it up to 100 degrees Celsius and enlarging it to about 1.107 cubic meters, you get the big hot hedron, or the bigger cube. There is also a pair of irregular polyhedra called the Kell-White polyhedra. One is made out of five-pointed stars and is called a small stellated dodecahedron. The other is made out of four-pointed stars and is called the stellated cube. The next irregular polyhedron, the Griffin polyhedron, only has one face and is known as either the wiggus 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 shape or simply the triangle. There is also a shape that one can make out of two skew epiragons, or bullshit, called the globule, which is completely distinguishable from Ray Bradbury. The final shape is the pair of nuts, made by duplicating a nut and attaching the two copies in such a way that it forms a vertex that exceeds the required quality of being just alright. And those are all seven irregular polyhedra. Or are they? Yes, yes they are. There are seven irregular polyhedra. I've been Jan Koto, and I don't understand why anyone would write a paper about polyhedra.